Okay, hello, I'm Jacob Barnett, and I'm here to do some quantum mechanics. So first of all, I decided to get my cat, my other cat, different from the one in the trigonometry videos. And I also have with me here this box. I am not going to put him in the box, that would be cruel. I am not trying to measure whether he's alive or dead. But we are still going to be doing some quantum mechanics. So, let's start. And I don't know why I have a torus drawn here. Anyway, we're going to do some Bohr radius, just to begin. It's really simple. If you can spell it. Okay, anyway, so let's start. Basically, in 1905, Planck suggested that the energy in a photon is quantized. In other words, in the light, the energy is h nu. It's just going to be quantized and times some number. In other words, this is the fundamental energy, and it's just some multiple of that energy. Okay, so we have this, and the next thing is we want to try seeing what happens in a hydrogen atom. At the time, there was some problem. We have this hydrogen atom, but electromagnetism theory predicted that the electron would just fall in to the center of the atom because of radiation. It's accelerated. But that wasn't occurred to happen. So what Bohr suggested was that something else was quantized. He said that not only should the energy be quantized, but we should also quantize the angular momentum. So this is MVR from classical mechanics. But we're also going to set this thing equal to n times h bar, where h bar just ends up being h over 2 pi. 2 pi, you can just think about it coming from the fact that it's a circle, and the total length is going to be 2 pi times some radius. OK. so. Let's begin with trying to find out how big the atom is. We want to figure out how big the atom is and see if it still decays to the center. So to find its radius, we also know that the electrostatic force is equal to Ke squared over R squared. This is just the Coulomb force. And looking at the circle, the centripetal force is mv squared over R. So this should also be mv squared over R. OK. so. From here, what we can do is we can say, okay, mv squared is equal to, by simple algebra, ke squared over r. So therefore, we get the velocity is root ke squared over mass times radius. We can plug it in there, and we can get the mass times the square root of ke squared over mass times radius times the radius, just subbing in for the velocity and angular momentum, is then h bar. And so we get that the square root of mke squared r is n h bar. Or in other words, the radius is n squared h bar squared and then divided by mke squared. The thing to get out of this is that the radius is also quantized. It depends on this number. It can't become smaller than when the number is 1 and it goes as n squared. So in other words, it starts here at 1, and then it goes up to 4 at 1 times this mass, which is called the Bohr radius, which you can call a, b. And then it goes out to 4, and then it goes all the way out to 9, etc. OK, so now I would like to try to start the particle in a box problem. I'm not going to discuss these problems in a extreme amount of detail, but I'm still going to introduce it, so I think I have a paper towel here. Okay. Okay. Just this. Okay, so now let's introduce the particle in a box. So first of all, we should introduce the Schrodinger equation. Basically, we're saying that things are quantized. So one way to quantize things is you can try, first of all, just think of the matrix. Then it has a certain number of eigenvalues that come out of it, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. So these things are clearly quantized. They're discrete. There's only n of them. There's not uncountably many. So we can think if we can try to represent quantities by such matrices that we can get quantized outputs. 
and these things in fact turn out to be the things that you measure in an experiment. So for one thing, there is the energy operator. Basically an operator is like a matrix, but it's infinite in size. And I like to put hats on my operators just because it reminds me it's an operator. So basically this is a matrix that's infinite in size. And to think of it like that, it's basically now a function on a function. So, you know, it can be like a d dx. It's a function on a function. So H, it's the Hamiltonian. It's just the operator that corresponds to energy. And what we want to do is we want to find the eigenvalues of this in general. So we'll say H times some state vector psi, which ends up being a function if we consider infinite dimensional space. This is E psi. And we want to find the psi's and the E's that satisfy this. These are the eigenvalues. These are the eigenkets, as they're called. So we have to find these. And in fact, this is called a time-independent uh, Schrodinger equation. So really, to solve this kind of an equation, it depends on the kind of system you're dealing with. For example, the particle in a box, it's represented by the potential is infinity, potential I'll call V, and the potential is infinity here and here, and it's zero here where this is zero and a along the x-axis. So we need to find the potential. So the Hamiltonian, we can split into two parts. This is kinetic energy, which I'll call T plus V. And I'll just operate it on the side. Now, we at V equals infinity, the psi has to be zero in order to cancel, so we don't really care about what happens there. We just want to solve the boundary value problem in this area. So we're going to set this thing equal to zero for now. And it turns out that this thing is the momentum operator squared over 2m times psi. And it turns out that the momentum operator p it ends up being, which can be shown by a lengthy process, this is i h bar del del x. So aware oh, this is the partial derivative with respect to x. And i h bar is just some constant. So this thing, when I square it, I get minus h bar squared over 2m, and we get d squared dx squared of some function psi. This is equal to the energy times psi, and we can now try to solve for psi. Now, the solution to a differential equation like this, it ends up being of the form, let's see. You can solve this differential equation for yourself. Now, it's second order, so there are two linearly independent solutions, and you can verify that one solution is cosine of a number times x, where k is just some number, and that number, in order to satisfy this, it ends up having to be the square root 2me over h bar squared. The reason for this is I take the second derivative, I get 2 of that square root, so 2me over h bar squared. I multiply by h bar squared over 2m, I get e left. And I differentiate the cosine twice, I simply get negative of the cosine. So this is one solution, and another one is sine of square root of 2me over h bar squared x. Okay, so great. I know the solution is this partial differential equation, which we got from the Schrodinger equation, but we want to know exactly which ones correspond to this problem. The first thing that we require is that the function has to be zero here. Because I already said that the function has to be zero when the potential is infinity. Because otherwise we just get something that's infinite and it doesn't make sense. So at zero, it's zero. So we can't have a cosine because the cosine is one at zero. So the entire function, it only depends on sine. Sine of square root two m e x over h bar squared x. It could, in general, the solution to this partial differential equation is some sum of these, but I can immediately get rid of anything depending here because of this guy. And I can also add some amplitude to it if I'd like. Now, the next thing I can do is I can look at A, and I can say, okay, it has to be zero there too. So therefore, and if I substitute in A, and I set this thing equal to zero, then this input has to be a multiple of pi, so we get the square root 2me 
h bar squared a, this is some number times pi. And so, in the end, of course, we can get that the energy, this is going to be n squared pi squared. I multiply by h bar squared, divide by 2m a squared, h bar squared, 2m a squared. So this is the energies for the particle in the box. They're still characterized by this n squared thing, which showed up for the radius, but not for the energy of the previous thing. Um, it does, in fact, show up for the energy only in the denominator. But anyway, here's the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator. And you notice that it's discretized, it's quantized in terms of the n. So in this example, we've just seen, okay, I have this expression for the energy, and I can solve for the eigenkets. They are this thing. And the A, you can choose it to be whatever you like. We haven't discussed normalization now. You, uh, 2 over A is good number. But um, anyway, so we just took this equation. We said, OK, I make my operator. I call it a Hamiltonian. And it just corresponds to the energy. And it's kinetic energy plus potential energy. And I considered a very simple problem. I said, OK, potential energy is 0 there, but infinite elsewhere. So if it's infinite elsewhere, the wave function is zero there, it's zero there, but inside it can do stuff. And Hamiltonian, this is energy operator, is kinetic plus potential. The kinetic is p squared over 2m, and you can see based off of experiments, this is i h bar over i h bar del del x, maybe with a minus sign. And so you can sub in, you can square, and you get this term. And you get this partial differential equation for psi. You solve it, and then you hook up the boundary conditions, and you get some final wave function, and you can find the energies. So basically what we've done is we now found the eigenvalues of the problem. So in general, most quantum mechanics problems are a lot harder than this one, but this one's pretty simple. And the previous one wasn't really a quantum mechanics problem. It was really showing how we can transition ourselves from regular mechanics to cla uh, classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, thank you for watching.